Thank you, Axiama team, for having us here. I just wanted to emphasize that we were um, working a lot uh, with internet crime and internet fraud, and this research uh, was the reason why uh, we made an artist in residency in Ghana in 2014. So we stayed one month in, in Ghana and also in the capital Accra. Uh, we um, visited a place called Abu Bloshi, which is one of the biggest e-waste dumps in the world. And uh, we had read articles about uh, e-waste at this dump uh, also that criminals uh, were uh, kind of extracting data uh, from hard drives there. So this is something that uh, was a curious point for us and we wanted to visit dump ourselves. So this is Ghana and Accra. Ghana is in West Africa. And West Africa is also on the route of global illegal waste traffic. So a lot of electronic waste gets dumped there. Often it's declared in the, as uh, donations, uh, but according to the Basel Convention, it's actually illegal to do this. On the map, you see where the dump is. It's very much in the city center. It's also um, connected to a canal, and when it's flooding, it has a direct connection to the ocean. So on the map, it looks very green and blue and nice, but this is how it actually looks. And on the video uh, here, you can also see uh, more footage from uh, the dump. A lot of journalists have also visited uh, Abu Bloshi uh, before. And here the guys are burning cables to collect uh, metal, copper. Uh, a lot of the activity there is connected to actually getting uh, the parts that are still valuable, selling it forward. Uh, we were this time uh, then emphasizing on if we can buy hard drives and if we can actually mine data from the dump. So this is from our visit. We had a local guide with us and uh, with the help of him, we were able to talk with the workers there. Also, we were buying from a lot of different uh, people the hard drives so that we had also the opportunity to, this, to discuss with the people. They had often in containers or in fridges, and they were saving all the valuable parts that they had uh, extracted and they were uh, sold in bulks, the hard drives. So in the end, we returned from Accra with 22 hard drives. Uh, three of them we could immediately access with data on them uh, just by plugging them in. Uh, two of them uh, we could uh, recover uh, by using open source uh, tools like PhotoRec and TestDisk. And then one of them uh, was still recovered by uh, technicians from a, like a data rescue company that we were also uh, collaborating with in Linz. So as a research question, where that can we recover any data? Can it be abused, used somehow? And how uh, can we see this as found footage or can we use this for artistic production. We joined with Servus AT and collaborated with them to organize a small symposium, art lab, and also then a publication. Uh, we had some experts talking at the symposium here with the different artists that we were inviting we were doing different kind of tests. We were also discussing the uh, ethics of using uh, material. And we were also sharing then the data with these artists. So in the end, we had at the Art Meets Radical Openness Festival, which is organized by Servus Ate. We had exhibition with more artworks that were both using the data, but it was also ex tended to be about saving, deleting, and resurfacing data. 
This was also the topic of a publication that we have outside uh, and this is kind of was our way of networking, also our way of finding artists that were uh, working with similar topics uh, and also discuss with them how to deal with this data. In the publication and in the booklet there is also more information about the artworks of the other artists, uh, how they uh, dealt with the data, what we have in the exhibition here. Uh, today uh, is our artwork, uh, the Forensic Fantasies. Just shortly, uh, I hope you will take some time to, to look at the artworks. We have one uh, package here. Uh, we were able to, uh, from one hard drive, to kind of trace the owner of the hard drive. And therefore, uh, we uh, chose to kind of make a speculative situation where we are sending the hard drive uh, to the uh, former owner back to the former owner and approaching this person through a letter. The second part uh, is the identity theft. The images that you see on the wall were images that we found on one of the hard drives. Uh, as we've been working uh, prior with fraud, we recognized pretty soon that these images uh, are images that uh, most probably are used for uh, something called romance scams, so scams where you uh, make a fake identity on, online and try to um, become friends, become uh, girlfriends with people online uh, in the thought of getting money off them in a way or another. Uh, this is also a quite typical um, scam in West Africa and in Ghana. Uh, and it's also uh, approach to uh, popular culture in, uh, in Ghana and in, in Nigeria to so-called Nollywood uh, films. So from three of the films um, that we bought actually in Ghana, uh, we were able to uh, make a 20 minute film that talks about this type of scam to their popular culture. Also, we uh, were then finding out that these girls are actually so-called webcam girls, and that's why there is so much uh, of this type of material online already. So these were the names are different profiles that we found for the same girl. So the, the, on this side of the, the <clears throat> wall, you have one girl that is, it's all the photos of the same girl and on the other side you have another girl uh, but it's also also images of the same girl but it's the different profiles that we found on under their name or under their images. And the last part of, uh, uh, of the uh, trilogy is uh, the photo albums in the middle and these are photos uh, that we were extracting from one of the hard drives and uh, it's a more personal view uh, into what you probably can find on a lot of people's hard drives. Uh, I will continue and talk a little bit about our ongoing uh, research that we are doing in um, South Korea. Um, a brief overview over the connectedness of uh, South Korea it has a very high online penetration of over 90%, has uh, one of the uh, high-speed uh, connected uh, countries in the world. Um, the mobile internet usage is above 80%. Uh, nearly 28 million people are using social networks and also they have their own messaging uh, services called Kakao um, that over 70% use on a daily basis uh, for chatting with friends but also for paying or as a banking system. Uh, to look on maps or to call taxis. So this is a multifunctional uh, app that everyone is just using. Um, and they have several uh, smart city projects and smart city initiatives since uh, 2004. Um, and our um, ongoing research is dealing with this. On the other hand, they are so technology advanced, but on the other hand, also socially lagging behind in terms of policies, then several critics and campaigners say that uh, South Korea is at a very low level. 
and uh, from a Korean progressive network center, um, there was one argument that this is probably because it's so government-driven and market-driven, the uh, ICT sector, and it's not really focused on the, the actual people's needs, but more on the economic and development. So the ongoing research project is called uh, the Internet of Other People's Things, dealing with the pathologies of a digital world. Um, we do this in cooperation with other partner universities like uh, Harvard, the King's College London, the University of Basel, and the University of Queensland. Uh, it's funded by the National Research Foundation, and it's a three-year uh, project grant that we work on at the uh, Wusong University. Our research scope uh, that we want to address in a, uh, artistic research is about the cooperatization of city governance, then the citizen-sensitive uh, participation, and in general, the security issues of smart cities and the Internet of Things. With this uh, research scope uh, as a background, we also have an open core, so we would like to uh, collaborate with other researchers, artists, hackers, activists, developers, um, to work on a publication uh, similar to the Behind the Smart World publication that Linda was showing before, um, but also to uh, address these topics uh, from uh, uh, outside of uh, the traditional boundaries of academic research uh, by um, collecting these uh, projects and combining them in a publication and uh, exhibition. So about the cooperatization of city governments, I have a, a quote that Siemens and Cisco aim to be the electrician and the plumber uh, of the new cities, and IBM tries to be or become their choreographer, um, their superintendent, the, and the oracle that combines all these sensor networks and this uh, technology infrastructure. So the problem that we see is also that it's it be becoming such a hyper-connected urban environments with uh, sensors and cameras everywhere. Um, this paths the way to technocratic governments and city developments where maybe companies have more to say than, um, than the city itself. Um, also technological lock-ins once you decide as a city to partner up uh, with uh, a certain um, company, then it's very hard to change the technology afterwards uh, and to, to use uh, a different provider. And of course, these cities become more and more uh, a surveillance uh, city and uh, also can be more easier hacked and uh, attacked. One of our uh, cities that we are looking at is uh, Songdo. Uh, Songdo is one city that was built from scratch. Uh, they started in 2004. Um, and as we see here, the Gale International uh, American company owns over 50% uh, of the city. Then 30% is owned by POSCO, which is a Korean steel manufacturer. And uh, Morgan Stanley owns around 9%. Uh, and uh, they partner with IBM and Cisco and LG to uh, provide uh, telepresent uh, screens or the infrastructure of the sensor network in the city. We also saw uh, some smart trash cans that you have here uh, in Korea, in uh, Songdo. They also have them implemented. Uh, you have to use your ID chip um, to access the trash can. Then you put in your trash. It gets uh, scaled uh, and weighed. Uh, and then through a pneumatic system, uh, gets uh, sucked like a vacuum cleaner to the next um, recycling facility where it gets automatically uh, recycled or at least sorted. Um, this is the plan and this was the implementation that they uh, did 2006 onwards. Um, but the reality is also that this system is not working. 
uh, you see posters uh, on the trash cans that please don't throw the trash in here, it's not working, and the trash is just uh, piling up and um, gets maybe picked up at night by a, a trash car or, or gets hand sorted and hand picked in a way. So it seems like this uh, global eco city, as you see on the banner there also, um, they try to, to promote the city as such, but uh, they have several technological issues also that are really hard to solve afterwards once you have this pneumatic tube system put in place. It's also very unflexible uh, to change it. Um, a second part where I just want to show one example is this citizen-sensitive participation. Uh, in Europe, you see a lot of uh, uh, grassroots movements and activists who are, uh, who are trying to shape the, the environments that they live in. Um, but how are these citizens involved in um, these co-design collaborations with private corporations and the public sector in Asia? Uh, since it's very top-down uh, and government-driven, um, you see these uh, guerrilla gardenings happening um, where there is a, a claim uh, where they want to build some uh, hospital or skyscraper in the future. And as long as this claim is not used, uh, people are gardening there and growing their vegetables and are using the city as they want to use it um, even if it's forbidden uh, by law, but uh, they are reclaiming the space and hack the city in their way. So this was uh, one interesting observation that we had, but we also look at, at in Songdo, but we also look at, at other um, ideas and concepts that are uh, done in Asia. Another one that we found very interesting is uh, from SafeCast. It's a do-it-yourself uh, Geiger counter. Um, the activist group was established uh, after the Fukushima uh, incident um, because the government was not providing accurate data about the radiation level to the public. Um, so activists uh, started to uh, create their own DIY versions of, of Geiger counters that are um, still very accurate. And they started mapping uh, all over Japan um, and share their uh, data uh, on an open street map so everyone can look up what are the most recent um, data samples that they were collecting. Um, this is also spreading out to, to South Korea. Um, with the uh, ongoing missile attacks by the north, uh, also the south is getting a little bit more sensible to what the radiation level uh, could be. But um, the same group also started to make uh, pollution sensors since the uh, air pollution is a big problem in, uh, in South Korea and they also want to double check what kind of data is provided by the city and what data can be collected by the local community. And last part are ongoing security issues that we want to document and monitor. As you know, with the, the Internet of Things, you have way more uh, surface to attack um, a city or a home or a state. Um, so we also look into this um, asymmetric um, power struggles. And as we saw also during the openings of the Olympics now, um, there were several hacking attacks that people couldn't print their tickets, but also parts of the opening had to be uh, delayed or even cancelled because uh, the network, the 5G network that they are testing now was also uh, under heavy attack. So by being in Korea and doing this research there, we also thought that uh, that's a very important uh, issue to, to continue to um, observe and react on also in an artistic way. So um, with this uh, brief overview of our ongoing research, uh, we would like to still show uh, a short video. Um, it's a recent video that we did, uh, a city portrait uh, about uh, Seoul. Um, and we try to portray the city through the lenses of 
uh, unsecured uh, public CCTV and private IP cameras. So these cameras are installed uh, in the public space um, and have a web server uh, integrated and through the internet they can be accessed. And often these web servers are very unsecure, have either no password or a standard password that you can look up in the manual of the, of the camera. Um, so we have a, a short video that shows uh, Seoul through the lens of these unsecured uh, CCTV cameras. And we also plan in the future to um, portray different cities uh, in a similar fashion. Um, the audio comments that are um, Koreans who are reading parts of the manuals um, where it's also addressed that there are no passwords or there is a weak password or um, you have to set it up yourself. So uh, just to give a framework about this. Congratulations on your purchase of the wireless day-night network camera. The infrared LED provides around-the-clock surveillance regardless of the lighting conditions. The camera also comes with remote monitoring and motion detection features for a complete and cost-effective home security solution. This series of IP monitoring product is the integrated IP network camera which is researched for network video surveillance monitoring. You can view and manage your camera from anywhere over the internet through the website or through the mobile apps for iOS and Android. You can view your live video feed, take snapshot, set a recording schedule and more. This series of IP camera is well suited for home and small businesses as well as any situation which needs to apply remote network transmission and remote network control. Controlling the camera and managing images are simplified by using the provided web interface across the network utilizing wired or wireless connectivity. It is suggested that a password be applied to network camera so that only the administrator can configure the network camera. If basic authentication is selected, the password is sent in plain text format and there can be potential risk of being intercepted. If you did not create a password, the default password is blank. Enter the username and password of the administrator. Default username is admin with a blank password and click OK to apply changes. There are some situations that allow client access to the live video without a username and password. 1. The administrator does not set up a root password. 2. The administrator has set up a root password, but set authentication to disable. 3. The administrator has set up a root password, but allows anonymous viewing. If 
default user after leaving factory is admin. The password is blank. Checking the password protected checkbox enables the username and password text boxes. Enter your login credentials. If the camera requires authentication, click the option link at the bottom right of your screen. Enter the default username and password as follows and log in. Username admin password 12345. It is recommended to change the password periodically. Before accessing a network camera via the internet, be sure to register a username and password to prevent the invasion of the privacy portrait right and the occurrence of information leakage owing to unintended access by an unknown third party. Dear customer, thank you for choosing to purchase and use our IP camera products. Okay, so that was it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>